Uh, so I'm going to start off, um, I'm talking about research in Indigenous context specifically, but a lot of the things that I'll talk about, if any of you are doing work in any kind of community-based work, a lot of these principles will be similar, but my focus is specifically around Indigenous people. <clears throat> and so even here you see the two lines that I chose on the very first slide is this idea of two worlds living in parallel. So we're all here, we're different, but we're somehow trying to figure out how we work together. <clears throat> So of course, we're in this lovely lecture theater where I can't smudge, but I did smudge this morning before I came when I prepared the tobacco for Judy. Um, and I also smudged today because one of my friends uh, recently took his own life and he's being laid to rest today. So I'm dedicating this to him and to all the other people who um, can't find ways to, to work through some of those things. And so it's really important. This is not a part of my culture specifically of smudging, but I learned it from Mi'kmaq people here in PEI and then Ojibwe and Cree and other folks all across the country. And it's become very much a part of my spirituality, a part of my everyday life, a part of understanding, giving thanks, uh, and just being part of this connection of the world. And so a little bit about me then, uh, my background, like I, I don't really fit in boxes, right? So that's why there's a list of 10 different things here that I do, because uh, I kind of do a little bit of all sorts of different things. Uh, a lot of it is in academia and around research and evaluation and those sorts of things. I teach at the University of Toronto uh, in the Aboriginal Studies. I also teach at the School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria. Uh, the joys of online teaching means you can be anywhere with a Wi-Fi connection and still do your job, which is a lovely thing. And then my passion has always been around finding ways that we can be working together in policy and research and communities and how those worlds work together. So this idea of intersectionality, right? This is what it looks like for me. It's not this like one in two lines that cross. It's all of these different ways that are coming together uh, in ways that I don't always understand. We don't always understand. That's why we still have uh, all this kind of work to do. And so as many uh, indigenous scholars, lawyers, physicians, doctors, everybody who's indigenous walking in the world that's not indigenous, we feel like we're balancing in between these two places. And well, it, if you don't have good balance, like a lot of us do, then it's very easy to kind of trip up and fall in. You don't feel like you fit anywhere. You don't feel like you belong on either side. So it's about figuring out negotiating that space that you're in individually and then how that works collectively within the work that you're doing. And one of the most important, if you get nothing else from the whole talk today, I hope remember this slide, the fact that research is relational and that it's about all of our relations. In academia, we artificially compartmentalize everything into little boxes and think that that's it, that we're just looking at this one thing. But it's more than that. It's, we're part of the cosmos, we're part of past and future generations, we're part of the plants, the animals, everything, our children, our family, everybody, everything in the world, we're all connected. So all of my research is all of my relations. And though, of course, in a research project, you can't look at everything. You need a research question that's specific, it's looking at one thing. But as a researcher, the responsibility is on you to make sure that you're understanding how that context fits in something bigger than just that one question that you're trying to answer. And so as I was preparing uh, for today, I came across this article by one of my friends and colleagues. Uh, she does really great work in uh, sexual health and HIV prevention. And they recently published this paper and the title, When You Follow Your Heart, You Provide That Path for Others. And so I feel like this is true for all of us. When we are actually, when we follow our passions, when we're, we can inspire other people to do that kind of work. And I feel like, and thank you, Judy, for acknowledging uh, the work that we've done here together. It's very, it's, it's amazing that it's started back 10 years ago and it continues today and people are still doing this work. I do want to remind people though that make sure you take your brain with you when you're following your heart. <laughs> Um, because sometimes, you know, if things go a little bit too emotional, then maybe that's not always uh, the best approach either. Um, thank you for laughing at my jokes. Um, so this, I saw this uh, image, I, I don't know how long ago, and one of my colleagues who was a friend back then, and we've worked together on tons of things since, she said that for her, what always made her excel or do more or accomplish or do things was always making sure she steps outside of her comfort zone. And so, as Brittany said, I'm going to do that today by sharing poetry that I've never done in my life. I've been writing since I was a child, but have never shared uh, anything 
publicly. So today, based on being inspired by uh, Rebecca, I will do that. So <laughs> the first one that I will read is called Serenity of My Identity. <clears throat> Diminishing my accomplishments, finishing my sentences, because you know what's best for me. My sense of self put on the shelf, defined by what you see, not who I am. Electrocardiogram to find my heartbeat. I'm obsolete with life incomplete. You're not discreet with your deceit. I take a back seat on your balance sheet. I overheat. Recovery's a verb, take action plan. My life began, short attention span. I'm not a deadbeat. I don't live on the street. I have a heartbeat. No more suffer, fuck the buffer, I'll say it like it is. No more censor for your ears, I've held it in too many years. Too many years, fueled by fears. I'm not a box on a questionnaire. Not impaired, not full of despair. In this collectivity, surrounded by creativity, jokes make levity, friends not selectively. Compassion through interaction, satisfaction with my own expansion, extraction, just a fraction of my own expansion. Your skin is too light and your words are too white. When reinforcement is this horseshit, it's no endorsement. When I fail, you say it's because I'm native, echoed words when I succeed. But you misread as I supersede your paternalistic ways. It's guaranteed to grow like weeds, your racist bloody tone. The measure of my indigeneity is not based on how many words I say. It's relational, not sensational. To indigenize, not theorize, the noble prize of compromise as we decolonize and rationalize. It's the original sin to take it on the chin, seeking to find that balance within, take personal responsibility. It's my own self-advocacy. I have the right to be myself, to love myself, to honor me. It's all about hope, a slippery slope to learn to cope. My resiliency, my legacy, reclaiming my identity. Tokenism, animism, <clears throat> the instinctual bit you bury inside. You make it hide in this game of seek. What's this you speak? The serenity of my identity is not up for debate. My name's sake, you activate this welfare state. I accommodate your heart of hate. I rejuvenate, you misappropriate. My strength through resiliency, the legacy I want to see that came before me. My ancestors were investors in me, my identity. Thank you. So also, for any of you who are here this morning and heard Rebecca, uh, she talked about two-eyed seeing. She also did a TED talk on two-eyed seeing, which I encourage you to, to watch if you haven't already. And so this comes from a Mi'kmaq elder in Nova Scotia called Elbert Marshall. And so on the one side, we kind of have this Western Eurocentric way. So for all of us who have been in academia, who are in academia, it's very competitive. It's egocentric. It's about individuals, what you do by yourself. Uh, it's all this, this, the theoretical pieces and being analytical, all of which are important and has its place. But on the other side, we have an indigenous, many indigenous perspectives. And then these are much more collaborative and cooperative. They're not based on individuals, but rather on communities. And so it's then how those two worldviews come together. When we take the best bits of both worlds and figure out how we move forward, how do we solve problems? How do we understand phenomena? How do we understand the positions that we're in right now? So this is kind of both a, a theoretical and a conceptual framework that many people around the country are starting to use uh, in policy, in research, in education, in all sorts of things, recognizing that, wait a second, maybe the way we've been doing it this whole time is not the only way to do it, that there's other ways that we can also incorporate this knowledge. So very simply and basically, of course, we always need to define what we're doing. What is this reconciliation thing that we're always talking about. Most basically, it is simply the restoration of friendly relations. And then those relationships are the way in which two or more people and things relate to one another. So arguably, some of my indigenous friends and colleagues will say there, it's not reconciling because we never were reconciled to begin with. So we're actually only starting from the beginning. Uh, and as you see here in this image, we all have a responsibility. Building that bridge together requires responsibility on both sides. It's not a us versus them thing, it's a we thing. We're all together figuring out how to work in this way. So the context for the work that I've been doing primarily, uh, we have Canada of course as a whole, that we have all of our laws and policies and governance structures and way things operate uh, on a national level. 
Each province and territory then, of course, has its own specific uh, laws of the land, way things operate, policies, procedures. And in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, are, where I'm from, and a, at least one other person in the audience also from, we also have different ways of doing things that may not always be uh, congruent with, with the provincial system. And so what we see here then are all these policies that are based on geographical belonging. And so where things get more interesting is when you bring in the people. For simplicity's sake, indigenous and non-indigenous people. And for those who don't know, uh, indigenous people in Canada, three very distinct groups under each one, also many more uh, distinct communities, Métis, Inuit, and First Nations. And here we see policies that are based on cultural belonging. So the thing that I'm interested in in all of the work that I do is what happens here in this middle place. What's happening when those two worlds are coming together? We all know we're coming from different backgrounds, so how do we figure out how to negotiate that space in between two worlds that seemingly really aren't compatible? Uh, but in fact, once you start to actually uh, look a little deeper, dig a little deeper, you start to realize that in fact, there's a lot more things that complement each other than there is that contradict each other. And I think people need to, to kind of start thinking of things in that way, instead of the us over here and them over here, it's more about how can we find those common grounds to then move forward in meaningful ways. So all that then to say is about indigenous people's right to self-determination. So this is something that's been ongoing for a very long time, but certainly only has been starting to get mainstream attention in the last few years. And so on a global scale, we have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And this was adopted in 2007, but at that time was rejected by four very prominent countries in the world, uh, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. It was in May of this year when Canada finally adopted the UN Declaration. But then less than six weeks later, the Justice Minister told us it was unworkable into Canadian law. So even though our country has adopted this, we still have a lot of work to do to figure out how we actually then implement it in our country, how we actually are allowing Indigenous people to assert their right to self-governance in whatever way that looks like for Indigenous people. So very quickly, I don't know what people's background is uh, in Indigenous studies or issues, so I assume many may have little or none, so I'm giving you the shortest, fastest history lesson ever in the next 30 seconds. Um, before European contact, Indigenous people lived all over, uh, well, all over the world, but we're talking specifically here in Canada, and the, we didn't have these artificial boundaries of provinces and territories, right? We had our own uh, areas that we lived in all over the place based on ideas of non-interference. It wasn't about doing better or getting more. It wasn't about those things. It was about figuring how do we work together for our communities? Not how do I become the richest or the most famous or all those things, but how do we sustain our families and our communities and our relationships with each other? And so in a lot of parts of Canada, the treaties that were made were made on these ideas. This is the first treaty of a Wapum Belt where, again, the two lines, um, canoes going down the river together, side by side, not interfering with each other. But that's, of course, not what's happened. Uh, there's been tons of interference um, from non-Indigenous people uh, toward Indigenous people in Canada. And so the treaty making, a lot of them were even, when they're written out, it's in peace and friendship. So it's, it's, it's really this fundamental human peace that existed even back then, that yet we still haven't found a way to actually do anything about in a lot of our provinces and territories. Uh, near the end of the 1800s, um, Canada comes with the Indian Act, which many argue is the most racist piece of legislation uh, that this country's ever seen, and perhaps maybe many other countries. Um, and then around that same time, we saw the beginning of the residential schools, where many Indigenous children were taken away from their homes and placed in schools. And this, this one slide could be an entire talk, so if you're interested in this, then for sure uh, find out a bit more about uh, that whole long process and even while that was still going on, in the 1960s, we had another thing happening in our country that is still happening today also when we talk about the 60s scoop. So many indigenous children taken away from their homes and placed in non-indigenous families. Not even only in Canada, also into the States. Some were even sent to Europe. Kids were taken away from their culture, their family, their things that were familiar to them and put in a completely different world. 
It was also in the 60s when Status Indians first got the right to vote. So the last people in this country to get the right to vote were the first people who lived in this country, which is not acceptable. So systemic racism then is not just one of those things that kind of just comes about once in a while. It's something that we are actively voting on with policies, with the way we create laws, and with the ways we disenfranchise people based on these larger collective issues. <clears throat> so if we fast forward then 20 or 30 years or so, bring us into the 1990s. It was around this time that the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples came out in Canada. This was five years, tons of money, tons of resources, tons of time. And their bottom line with their, their hundreds of recommendations was this idea of a renewed relationship. So we've been talking this language of renewing a relationship with Indigenous people for a very long time. And so you'll see here, they kind of base it on these ideas of responsibility. Oh, we all have a responsibility to play in this area about sharing our resources, our knowledge, our systems, respecting each other and recognizing uh, not only the differences, but also the things that we have in common and similar with each other. And it was during that same time in 1996 that the last residential school in Canada closed. So I, like, I, I often say that to people and they think, oh, I thought that was like 100 years ago or at least 50 years ago or at least all these years ago. But it's not, it happened, I'm pretty sure all of us were around in 1996. This is not ancient history. This is still something uh, that clearly would have impact on people still. So then 12 years after the last residential school closed in 2008, the federal government of Canada gave its official apology for the residential schools. And so, uh, of course, there's mixed uh, feelings about what that uh, apology was about, but essentially it's about removing uh, and isolating children from their homes back then, and uh, it was infamously said, it was about killing the Indian in the child. So to take away all that makes you you, your culture, your language, your ideas, your values, the systems that make you who you are, to take that away from you. So some of you may have seen this a couple of years ago um, when they were first starting to release some of the information from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that in fact the odds of dying in residential school was greater than the odds of dying uh, in the Second World War. And so again, children from Indigenous communities were being put in these situations where, where this was commonplace. And so the result then, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, uh, they've produced an amazing amount of work. Uh, if you have like tons of free time as most graduate students have. I mean, just go and read this light little reading while you're taking a bath or whatever you do. Uh, they have tons of calls to action. If you have no time for all the rest of it, I at least encourage you to read those. It is 94 of them, it's still several pages, but I encourage you to at least read those. Understand the responsibility that every single Canadian has in building this relationship with Indigenous people. And so here are just a couple of the ways or the the sectors or areas that they talk about in the TRC, of course, health and justice, areas where we're constantly seeing an overrepresentation of Indigenous people. And of course, my interest then is specifically around education. And one of the, the, the chairperson of the TRC, Marie St. Clair, who I've, I've had the honor to see speak maybe 10 times now, and every time, he's just, he's a brilliant man, and he says here that while Indigenous children were mistreated in residential schools, by being told they were heathens and savages and pagans and inferior people, that same message was being delivered to non-Indigenous students in the public school system. So we were all being told this story, this narrative that was not coming from Indigenous people, but rather coming from others who were saying what they thought of Indigenous people. So clearly then, the time for action has long gone, right? It's the action, the calls to action now, great, but this, Time for Action has been around for a long time. I saw this great uh, tweet a few days ago, uh, just after the, the inquiry was released for the missing and murdered Indigenous women, someone tweeted this. So back in 1991, when they first decided to do the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, they said, oh yeah, our cap will be a game changer. This is it, we're gonna change Canada this way. Then we said the same thing about the TRC in 2008. Now we're saying the same thing about the inquiry in 2015. How many more times, if I come back in 10 years and do a talk, will I have five more years where we keep saying this will be a game changer or will we actually change the game? So this is what tends to happen for too many people. You're saying, 
you're saying one thing and then you're going in the other direction. So we have lots of people who are saying the right words. They're saying what, we, what they think we want to hear. In fact, maybe sometimes we do want to hear it. But then their actions don't follow. The walk that they're doing is not the same talk that they're giving. So it reminds me very much of this concept of, you know, do the best you can till you know better. But once you know better, then you should do better. And I think most Canadians need to, we, we know better now. It's in mainstream media, it's everywhere you look. It's everywhere you look. So we know better. Why is it then that there's this place where we know better, but we're not doing better? What needs to change? What needs to happen? I found, it was great. I remember back to my first years of psychology with this great old Philip Zimbardo and all those videos I used to watch of him. And he talks about evil as knowing better, but willingly doing worse. So if you're not actually doing better with what you know, then uh, maybe you need to reconsider what it is that we're doing. So, like I said, many people have this, I'll say one thing, but then my actions don't follow with what I'm saying. And I hope that uh, more of us will learn how to talk and walk the same direction. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I am trying to walk the talk and to work with people, not, not on them or for them, but with them in ways that are meaningful uh, to these communities. So if we think back 15 years ago, Things were different, like technology has changed so much in the last 15 years that it's had, we've had no choice but to change and to shift and to grow uh, with that technology. <laughs> and so back then, I was just starting my undergrad degree, you know, the, the real go-getter type, like, oh, learning all these new things and these new concepts and, and all this great stuff. And people would always say to me that it's because people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are actually the ones who can. So for all of you, the students especially who are here, who you have friends and colleagues and people who tell you that you're just being too optimistic or too naive or too whatever you are, don't listen to them. Because it is actually the people who think that they can do it who will do it. So keep doing whatever that it is for you. So I came to the University of Prince Edward Island. No one in my family ever graduated high school. I knew nothing about university. I knew nothing about anything, about whatever. And so what I did learn when I came here though, was that you really can find your passions in whatever place they may be. For me, it was in philosophy. And other than my philosophy professors, and thank you for coming, uh, nobody else understood why the hell I would be doing philosophy. What are you gonna do with that later? That doesn't seem like you're gonna get a good job with a philosophy degree. Um, nonetheless, I was passionate, I loved it, I loved ethics, I loved understanding how people operate, and then I took psychology, which made me start to understand more about people individually. And so together, that really started to give me a really good foundation for understanding kind of society and why. Why are we here? Why are we doing these kind of things? And so I was talking to a sessional lecturer about my honors thesis, which was about indigenous students. And the response was, but there are no Aboriginal people in PEI, which made me go, say what? <laughs> So that alone was enough for me to go, okay, I need to do more than just my academic stuff and that's great and I love that and that's personally fulfilling and maybe someday th there will be some greater benefit to my philosophizing about why things are the way they are, but what can I actually do? So I started to actually try to do something. And in 2007, this group of, of ladies, um, four others and myself, with the help of Ruth, who's sitting here in the audience also, um, we put on the very first uh, Connecting Aboriginal Cultures event. We had a huge $100 budget to uh, put on this event. And as you know, I mean, $100 is no money. I don't know what, what anybody can do with $100, but we did because we had relationships with people. We had people in the communities who were eager. We had students who were eager. We had people, faculty, staff, people who recognized that this was important. So we made that $100 stretch as far as you can imagine. And we had an awesome day. There were probably maybe a hundred or so people that came. It was small, but it was lovely. It was beautiful to see children, especially, on a university campus who may otherwise have never been to one, who, who may not have known anyone who went to one. And then they were here, they were running around. I remember somebody saying to me like, wow, like everybody is just there and they're a community. Like the children are running up to everybody. They're, it's not like, oh, sit here next to mom and dad and don't go anywhere. It's very much a collective and a community kind of work. 
And so then in 2009, uh, we opened the Maoyomi Aboriginal Center on the top floor of Dalton, which couldn't, this is the worst place on campus to put anything because nobody ever wanted to go there. There was clearly no walkthrough traffic because nobody's walking through the top floor of Dalton. Even people who had offices there who, didn't, who had to be there kind of didn't want to be. <laughs> And then um, what was really awesome, I guess because we were on the top floor of Dalton and nobody really went there, uh, we were given permission to paint the wall in Maoyomi. So it was a really great day. Again, you see here like Ethan, I think Ashley uh, Jadis' son was there. He signed his name to the wall. Uh, people put their handprints there. We just had a great Saturday afternoon where everybody came together. We ate some food. We chatted. We sang. There was some drumming. And people just expressed themselves here on campus in a way that they were never able to do before. And then the next year, you see here, look, it looks a little fancier than the first one. So it, we had a bit more money, we had $1,000 this time. So it was, a lot, it was a lot easier to get a few other people involved. And then I don't have pictures of the next one, but in the third year, uh, I got money from Canadian Heritage to really put on a huge, it was a full two-day event. It was on the one side, this kind of celebration of indigenous culture with the dancing, the singing, and, and all those bits, but then a very much an education piece about teaching uh, non-indigenous students and faculty about making baskets, about dream catchers, about this, about smudging, about ceremony, about keeping your spirit in your work, something else that we don't do in most mainstream uh, ways. We are people, that's it, you're in your mind. You don't have a spirit or your spirituality is not included as part of the work that we're doing. And what I'm very happy about is that this event has continued to go on. So that, again, it's all it takes is for someone to do that, to get the, the wheels moving and get the right relationships, the right people working with you. And then this continues. So next year, uh, I think next year will be the, the 10th year of this event. So that's been happening now at UPI for that long. And today, I mean, I walked out, I sat on the bench, the Mi'kmaq bench there for a long time and took a picture. It's just, it's beautiful to see that we're, we're allowing indigenous people to have space on this campus uh, and to share all of the amazing gifts and work that we've been doing. And many of you may not know this, um, but the folks that were instrumental in creating Maoyomi to begin with also really helped uh, the College of the North Atlantic in Labrador. During my last few months here at UPI, uh, their director, I think he was director of education at the time, he came, he was on PEI for something else, but he heard about this Maoyomi Center. I didn't know him. I know Labrador is small, but we really don't all know each other. Um, <laughs> So I didn't know him, but he came to my office and said, hey, like, this is really cool. We heard about what you guys are doing at Maoyomi, uh, how you're having this event on campus and how indigenous students are starting to come and it's starting to, to build this kind of capacity. And so we talked, I mean, I think we were probably talking for three hours about just the ins and the outs, the challenges, the successes, all the different things. And uh, it turns out that they then created something in Goose Bay that's very similar at the College of the North Atlantic. And so I had the honor to be there recently for something unrelated. And they took me there and I sat in there and I mean, even the furniture kind of looks the same as what we had, like everything, all about it. He took the, the, the encouragement of having uh, elders who were present for people, uh, about having young people coming to the campus, not just having adults who are students, but also having spaces for the adults who have children to also bring them so that it's a family thing, having everybody involved, a community, a community, a collective, all of us together building those kind of relationships. So at the same time, I was doing all that cool stuff. I was also a graduate student who really just liked to go to coffee shops and think about research methodology. So um, in that, my focus was on ethics and on research ethics specifically. Um, back then it was about the CIHR guidelines for research involving indigenous people. Not long after that, it morphed into the Tri-Council Policy Statement for Research Involving Humans, which does have a full chapter chapter nine on research involving indigenous people. And so I think, it's, I think it's an important chapter for everybody to read whether or not you're actually engaged in that kind of work, but just to kind of get a bigger picture sense of why this is the way it is and why we need to have those uh, ethics considerations in doing that kind of work. So very briefly, kind of research ethics 101, the, the, the whole idea of protection of, of participants in research came from the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War. And then over time, there's been several very uh, important documents that have helped us understand and shape why and how we need to protect 
uh, participants in research. And so this is just kind of general mainstream, all people. We need to protect all people in research. Um, but then specifically, there's been a movement, especially within the last 15 to 20 years or so, but even more so in the last decade, uh, that's specific to indigenous people, how we're in kind of making indigenous research ethics also important. And so one of the, the main uh, documents then is OCAP, Ownership, Control, Access and Possession. And this is, uh, it was specifically for First Nations, but there are some other Indigenous communities who use uh, kind of this principle-based approach. I heard some of the students presenting today and it was lovely to hear them say, this is not a prescription. We don't have prescriptive ways of doing this kind of work. It's about, it's principle-based. We just, we have these kind of general ideas and, and how we're going to get there, but there is no if A, then B, then C. That's just not how <laughs> people work. So if we're doing research with people, we can't expect that to work either. <clears throat> so one example of how um, the indigenous ethics, OCAP, is being used is here at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs. And you see this is a very uh, interconnected and circular kind of model. It's not a linear model. Every research ethics model that I've looked at from a Western perspective is a straight line across that tells you what to do. This is different because that, it, the world's not a straight line. That's not how it actually works with people. And so indigenous people are using frameworks that are more holistic and are using things in this more collective way. So what that meant for me as a grad student was that I had this many research ethics processes to go through which was horrendous. I don't recommend doing more than one community if you're uh, doing a master's degree. That's only one or two years. So it took a very long time to go through that whole process of learning how to negotiate these spaces. Universities wanted one thing, health authorities wanted another thing. Uh, the provincial legislation in Newfoundland and Labrador, which no other province has, wanted its own thing. Then all the three communities I worked in had its own thing. You get it approved at one, then the other doesn't like it. So you know, it, it can go on forever. So it's a very, it was a great learning experience of, of kind of how to navigate that world. For a long time, I felt like I was just buried under this paperwork that I couldn't get rid of. I think now many places are letting people submit electronically, but back then there wasn't. So you had to like 12 copies of everything that you were doing for all of these different projects. It was, I think I probably killed half the rainforest in doing this kind of work. And then how I felt and how many of my friends and colleagues even now still feel in doing this kind of work is that there is no right way to go. They feel like, okay, I don't know what you expect from me because I, every way is the wrong way. Um, and so though I did feel like that sometimes, I was very privileged and honored to meet people, elders especially, who helped me realize that all that administrative stuff, all that fine, it takes time, it, it's all those things, but the really important bit about working in indigenous context was this concept of authenticity. So while I was interested in research ethics and policy and how that was happening on a national level, what the implications of that was for people in communities, what was more valuable was understanding from people in communities that they want people to be authentic in their relationships. Don't come with your grand idea and your million dollar budget and tell us what you're gonna do. That's not building any kind of relationship. So it's about those fundamental pieces. And so the way it was e most succinctly summed up for me was with the Anishinaabe's uh, grandfather teachings of honesty, truth, humility, love, wisdom, courage, and respect. All things that I guarantee we don't talk about in a biology class or in any other science or most even humanities courses. These aren't things we talk about or understand. But this is what, this is how we are as individual people. Like you're not just a professor or a, whatever, you are a person who has all of these human characteristics. So these need to be transferred into the research that we're doing, not separated. A talk I heard today from another student said the same thing. You can't separate yourself from the work that you're doing. This idea of objectivity is like floating out there in the world somewhere because you are part of it. Whether you, you can think there's no bias, but there is because you are part of it and you have your own perspective, your own understanding of things. So that comes with you in the work that you're doing, whichever context it may be in. And so that concept alone as what's garnered the attention, uh, specifically in the work that I've been doing in Labrador, the world's looking to Canada because sadly, Canada is the leader in indigenous research ethics. I say sadly because how far behind we are, yet we are further ahead than, than most other countries. Even places like New Zealand where they are 
ahead of us, I guess, in some ways when it comes to health services and, and health uh, for Maori people. But they are not when it comes to the governance of research and how we actually are building these relationships, how we're encouraging indigenous people to become researchers, how we're encouraging academics to leave their ego at the door and listen instead of just talk. So to move forward then, um, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, maybe seven things I've kind of learned that I think will be helpful for other people doing this kind of work. First of all, it's moving away from this deficit-based model. So we hear all of the negatives all of the time. You can read any news article, watch any program, you can see whatever rates of negative things that you can find. But if you dwell on that, then you will, you will find yourself in a rabbit hole and never get out of it. Because what we, whether we think we can or we can't, we're right, and so it's the same idea here. If you're focusing only on the deficits, it's almost impossible to see what the possibilities might be. So instead of those people who find the problems in everything, find solutions, look at things, okay, so we have what's this deficit, but how do we look at it from a strength-based perspective? What's working in a community? Don't think also that what works in Charlottetown will work in some other place, right? I mean, everywhere has context that will make it different. And so about using this strength-based approach really changes things. Even back when I did my undergrad, before I even knew what this language really even meant, I wasn't interested in talking about what's wrong with indigenous people for not going to post-secondary. I was interested in why, how are these really cool indigenous students who are successful, what are they doing? How can we take that and harness it and help other people do something similar? Focus on the strength, focus on the positive. So again, it's about then what is the biggest strength? What is it that's working already in a community? What do other communities see that they, oh, this works over there. Maybe we can modify that in a way that fits us and then we can work through it that way. So I wanna just use, this is a hashtag that's on Twitter, uh, Indigenous Rising. Uh, if any of you have any great stories to tell about indigenous people, I encourage you to use this hashtag. And I wanna share with you a few really awesome indigenous people around Canada who are doing cool things. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we were talking about how we were greatly underrepresented in, in uh, politics nationally, and then this year, or last year now, uh, we have a record number of indigenous MPs across the country. Jordan Tutu, people love their hockey in Canada, apparently. And so it's very cool that he was the first Inuk to become a member of the NHL. And what's more important, I think, uh, for a lot of indigenous people is not that he's an NHL star, but that, but that he then wrote about his challenges and his successes in being that. When you're an indigenous person from a community where there are a lot of challenges and you become that person that does something different and goes off and, and becomes successful in whatever way that might be, you then face a lot of other challenges. So he wrote a book that talks about those challenges and how he uh, dealt with alcoholism and other sorts of things like that. And now he's sober and is committed to helping and encouraging other indigenous people to learn how to find their gifts. As Judy said this morning and today, and I hear all the time, we all have a gift. Gifts, most of us have many. And so it's about finding out what they are and learning to share them in that positive way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then Susan Glucart, someone I've been listening to for years, and uh, recently she's uh, uh, won the Governor General's Performing Arts Award. Again, first Inuk woman to do this. Um, I'm really not into pageants, but um, Miss Universe recently, not only the first Indigenous person in Canada, but the first Canadian, actually, to have uh, this title. And if any of you are into the reality show stuff, her and her dad are now on The Amazing Race as well. Um, I was very privileged to see this documentary in Toronto called The Angry Inuk that talks about um, the seal hunt and the seal ban and the implications that uh, the, the, the ban on the commercial seal hunt has had on indigenous people living in the north. And um, it was fun to watch the audience, people who uh, really had never thought about it from a different perspective before. They just, all they could picture was Paul McCartney with the cute baby seal in the club and they didn't know, oh, there's actually a whole other side to this story that we never even considered before. And they actually then won uh, the People's Choice Award at that film festival in Toronto. And so very proud of the work that they've been doing. And for the last two years, Indigenous women have won the Players Prize in Canada. Tanya Tagak won it last year in 2014. And then one of my favorite Indigenous people in life, Buffy St. Marie, also won it last year in 2015. 
And if we turn things back over here to like a more academic way, uh, just this year, uh, the first First Nations student in Canada became a Rhodes Scholar. So he's off now doing really cool things. Uh, and this morning we saw here, Rebecca uh, named a Poet Laureate in Halifax. And even more close to home, Jenna Burke, as many of you may know if you're in Charlottetown, has been instrumental in doing so much work. Without her and the relationships and the connections that she had in communities, I'm not from PEI. I didn't want to impose my ways of doing things on people in PEI. I knew that I needed to build these relationships. And by virtue of building one, you don't just gain that one person. You then gain their networks, right? You're, we're all connected. So it's about finding those partnerships that then you really actually can and kind of make this movement happen. Speaking of movements, larger movement of I don't know more that's happening all across the country. Indigenous people, grassroots women who are just, who have mobilized to really challenge the way that people are looking at Indigenous people in Canada. And in Toronto, it's been a really humbling and beautiful thing to see the relationships being built between I don't know more and Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, sorry. So uh, the top picture here is from the Toronto Pride Parade that happened last month. Tons of controversy over uh, Black Lives Matter protesting in the middle of the parade. Um, nonetheless, in this circle of people, there were young indigenous people sitting with drums with them in solidarity, recognizing that we are fighting a very similar fight. We're, we experience a lot of the same kinds of racism, same kinds of discrimination, same kinds of systemic stuff that happens, right? Why is it that if your skin is not white, you get shot more? Why is it that all of these things are happening? And so when uh, Black Lives Matter is happening, we have indigenous people supporting them. When things like Occupy INAC, uh, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, I don't know if a lot of it came out this far east, but certainly in Central and Western Canada, uh, for, for several days and weeks in some cases, Indigenous people um, occupied these offices uh, in response specifically to suicide rates in the north, in northern Ontario. And what's, what I find, I guess, personally satisfying, and then also seeing again how when you plant little seeds, it might take a long time, but over time, they start to grow. And so in this um, protest during Toronto Pride, I worked several years ago with a, a few young indigenous two-spirit youth in Toronto who are homeless. They come to Toronto because they're two-spirit. They already face so many challenges at home. They go to a big city thinking, okay, I'll find my way here. But holy shit, it's really different in Toronto than it is in Northern anywhere. So you get there and then you're like, well, I don't know what to do. It costs $1,500 for an apartment. I, I make minimum wage. How do I even make that happen? So it was heartbreaking for me to do that kind of research, but I, I don't do research for the sake of answering a question and then putting it in a book somewhere. When we did this work, we knew we were committed to doing something for these young people. So we got money from the city of Toronto to do the research project. Then at the end, when we produced this beautiful, not, not re we produced a report for them, but then what was beautiful was that what the, the young people created, uh, a pamphlet, a zine, and all these much more accessible pieces of information. But the city of Toronto said, oh no, well, we don't really have anything, any more funding to help you do something with that. But we, we, my team, our team at the time, aren't the type to be like, oh, okay, well, then we'll just go along. We, instead, we're like, well, then we will find somebody that, that does have money and is committed to this kind of work. And so we did, and we found sustainable funding for a program that's called O'Day. It's about, our original project was called Forgotten Voices. O'Day is Remembered Voices. So it's about bringing together all of those voices. It's a drop-in center, a floating mobile drop-in center. It's not a physical space, uh, but we have p staff hired who work with young people, and they were so involved with uh, the Black Lives Matter. They were the ones that were sitting there on the street in the circle with their drums, singing and dancing and praying and sharing that space with other people, and it was very powerful to watch. So the second thing, this idea of equality and equity that we always talk about, I mean, equality is sameness, right? We all get the same. That must be equal, so that's good. Um, maybe not so good. You see this poor little guy here, you can't see anything because he's a lot shorter. So if you're more equitable then and you give people things uh, in a different way, maybe that's a little better. But I argue then that the third option is even better still, and that's where you actually just get rid of that systemic barrier to begin with. If you don't have the barrier there, we don't need accommodations, we don't need special supports. You actually can all just enjoy the game as it is. 
The third thing, following this idea again of a GPS, um, guiding principles and strategies, right? It's not about a prescription. And so these um, principles and strategies, we need them because we don't have Garmin that makes a moral GPS. It would be really awesome if we could just punch in like, is this the right thing to do or not the right thing to do? But we can't do that. So instead we're left with uh, the good old moral compass about what's right and what's wrong. And uh, this reminds me a lot of the indigenous people I work with when they talk about, there's not even a word in our languages for ethics and all these other academic things we talk about, but they say, you know, being true to yourself and doing the right thing, that is, that's what it's all about. It's about those humanity things. And so those principles and strategies then, about the four R's, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. And uh, most importantly, it is about the relationships. And so the, those then are all the building blocks of how it is that we're working in these contexts. The fourth thing, uh, we need to know about cultural awareness. Of course, we acknowledge there's difference, that's important. Um, People start talking then about cultural sensitivity, recognizing that the, there's importance of respecting those differences. But then there's cultural competency, uh, how we focus on the skills and knowledge. But what a lot of people are really hopeful for is cultural safety, <laughs> where we're being reflective on the work that we're doing uh, as we're working through these things. And being humble in that work, recognizing you might know everything there is to know about whatever you studied, but then there's a larger context that you know nothing about. So finding the ways then to make people feel safe when you're working with them in any kind of context. The fifth thing, my favorite one, my favorite quote from any project I've ever done, <laughs> just suck less. When asked what can people do to help working with indigenous people, just suck less. And to do that, there's a bringing together the consultation piece we hear constantly, duty to consult, consult with indigenous people, it's very important, um, but it's about doing it in a way that's in communication with each other is an important way. But cooperating with each other, of course, and consent. This is not just about research, this is anything. Uh, you can't just extract resources without people's consent. That needs to be an ongoing process. So all that together then is collaboration. It's that real, true, meaningful collaboration. And it's not about just gluing individual egos together. It's about the idea that these ideas didn't even exist before until we were all here together. And if we were to have a dialogue, then that's when the ideas come. And that's very much tied then to number six, which is building relationships. And it's this, again, circular process. There is no, there's no linear way of doing this. We figure some stuff out, we do some stuff, we see it, we make some mistakes, we learn from it, we do it again, and we just keep going in that circle. So we all then have a responsibility, and I think I'm talking too much, so I'm gonna skip this poem so that we can move on to the next part. Um, so things that you can actually do right now, um, all of you, no matter what your background is, no matter what your work is, things that you can do, buy local indigenous products. Don't buy things from the bay that were made who knows where. Find local indigenous people who are making, if you want moccasins, find someone who makes moccasins. Buy them from a local arts and crafts person. Take the pledge to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's actually a whole website you can go to and you can click on it and say, I will do this, and then it sends you little reminders. So that, Did you read it today? And uh, so that's something we can all also do. Learn about the treaties and agreements. When people say, like, just get over it, well, you you don't understand the whole context of what's happened up to now. So we all have a responsibility then to take that and learn about what those treaties and agreements were. Attend local festivals, everywhere has them. Every province, every place you go, small, big, and all over the place that they're there. Read and watch films and books by indigenous people. Not white people telling you what they think about indigenous people. There's tons of those, there's tons. but. There's also an increasingly greater amount of indigenous people who are creating films and documentaries and books and poetry. Find them, read them, listen more than you speak. Challenge the stereotypes and then finally speak up. When you hear people saying things that you know are not right, then say something about it. Here in um, PEI, it's a great time of year, it's powwow season. So uh, this weekend, Lenox Island has their powwow. Next week here in Charlottetown, there's a powwow. And next weekend, Pamir Island has a powwow. So for all of you here, there's time, uh, weekends or weekdays where you can go enjoy, uh, buy your moccasins, buy whatever things you want from local folks. So for people who like to see the list at the end with all the things I just said, uh, the seven things that, that are important in this kind of work, 
using a strength-based approach, addressing the systemic barriers. They don't change overnight. You can't you're not wake up and go, oh, today I'm changing the systemic barriers. You can't, but we can all keep poking away at them slowly. And if we're all doing that, eventually the system has to change. There's no other choice. Using principle-based approaches instead of prescriptions, understanding the importance of cultural safety and humility, and just sucking less. Like whatever you're doing today, if tomorrow you just suck a little less than today, and then if every subsequent day after that you suck less, eventually we won't suck at all. Um, <laughs> of course then, the building the relationship, this was all about, the whole thing is about building these relationships. And by doing that, participating in the community. You might be a researcher and doing whatever you're doing, but when you go to a community, you're just who you are. I'm just Julie, I just go there, I wear my flip flops, I go, I hang out, I camp, I do the things that, that the community is doing. I'm not other, they're not other, we're just all people. So to conclude, a few final remarks to kind of tie things up a little bit. If you change nothing, nothing will change. So all of us keep saying, oh, well, why doesn't someone do something about that? You're all someone. We're all someone. We all can do something about it. And so it was reminding me about Anne Frank and how she talked about, I mean, people who have really challenging situations who know, isn't it amazing that you don't need to wait a single moment to change anything? You can do it right now. We can all leave here and change how we were before we came in here. And so remembering the idea of two-eyed seeing, 2, 10, 25, 30 I'd seeing, right? There's many perspectives, many ways of bringing these different worldviews together. The idea of success, people think it's like this linear line that just goes up. I used to be like this. I thought, finally, yeah, I'm on it. I'm on the, the path of success. I'm just gonna keep going up. Then you learn, no, it's actually a lot more like this. It's messy, it's complicated. You go up, you go down, you go all over the place. It's about learning to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's hard, none of us want to be. None of us want to be uncomfortable. But like Rebecca said this morning, you can be uncomfortable and still be safe. And that's what's important. I think that was really important what she said, that we need to create those spaces that are safe for people to be uncomfortable with each other. Living our lives by compasses, not clocks. Very hard to do uh, with the constraints of funding and, and all the other bits that happen. But really trying to not be so focused on, I need to get this in right now. Like instead, the general direction of where we're trying to go, rather than just all those specific deadlines and timelines. Constantly and repeatedly I hear nothing about us without us. Why is it still in 2016 that people think that they can do stuff on indigenous people and not include indigenous people in that work? Still happens, so remember, nothing about us without us. And even the Dalai Lama, smart guy, he even knows that when you're speaking, you're only repeating what you already know, but when you listen, you might actually learn something else. And I think we heard this morning, we have two ears, one mouth, use them proportionately. We should listen more than we talk. Um, integrating them, when we're listening, we're learning, we're integrating the theory and the practice together and figuring out how they relate to one another and how we then learn uh, in those different ways. What I'm very excited and proud of is that the grassroots voices are getting louder continuously through movements like I Don't Know More, through smaller movements in little individual communities, and then collectively uh, on a global scale. Even Dr. Seuss knows, he has the five lessons of life about, you know, being true to yourself, doing what's right. Um, and those who, my, I guess the favorite one, right, is that those who don't mind, or those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind, right, those kind of things. Um, one of my favorite uh, researchers, Brene Brown, she sums up authenticity in this way. I rarely read, but this one is, authenticity is not something we have or don't have. It's a practice, a conscious choice of how we want to live. Authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up, and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let ourselves, our true selves, be seen. And so again, remember, outside the comfort zones where the magic happens, and it's about cooperation, not competition, and there's more than one way to get to the same place. So five plus two equals seven, but so does three plus four, and so does one plus six. So there's lots of different ways of reaching similar conclusions. And so I will end um, with the last poem today called Stand Proud. A history of discrimination, segregation, and assimilation, a past full of heartache, toil, and tribulation, a present full of rebuilding, reaffirming, and reclaiming, a future of hope with promise and no more blaming. The future of our children is in our hands, stopping the divide between nation and bands. A common goal is a solid foundation, together united as one nation. 
power in numbers and strength in community, standing together for the world to see. The Indian problem has not been eradicated. The root of the cause still constantly debated. The origin seems irrelevant when consequence is blatantly obvious. So why does such discussion cause argument and chaos? We've adopted and adjusted to modern day life through years of struggle, challenge, and strife. On our pathway to change, we will fight. We will continue to move forward. We will unite. Governments come and governments go. Promises broken make friend over foe. Despite circumstances and because of them, we grow as proud, strong, indigenous people. We will not be silenced. We will not be forgotten. Right here is where I belong. I will continue to sing the song, constantly and continually securing my identity, generations before me fighting for my liberty. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. My roots firmly planted, continuously growing. Don't you want a, diver a society that embraces diversity, a society that encourages individuality, a world where the water's blue and the grass is green, a world where nature's beauty is still serene? The road not taken, we're creating our own. We've always been here, this is our home. Join together, make your voices loud. Always remember, stay strong and stand proud. Thank you. And. I know there's at least one or two other ethics geeks in the audience, so for those of you who are like me, there's a really cool book that just came out recently that I was very honored and privileged to have a chapter in, the only indigenous one um, around uh, two I seeing approach to indigenous uh, ethics review. And then the whole book is about alternatives to research ethics review. So for anybody who's not doing clinical trials, which is what it's all based on, all the rest of us, we, we have all sorts of cool things in this book to talk about. So with that, I will say, Nakomik, thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to chatting more over there with the, the food and other good things. Thank you.